we're going to move on into imaging. And I think every neuro-oncologist knows just how important our neuroradiologists are in our, in our day to day and for our patient care. And I'm really honored to present our first speaker, Dr. Sunisha, who is a professor and she's the program director of diagnostic radiology um, at UCSF, the associate program director of the integrated interventional radiology residency, um, and really just an absolutely incredible neuroradiologist and also a wonderful person, always there to pick up the phone and help us interpret scans. Um, and pretty much can always predict the pathology even before the pathologists speak. So we really are truly honored to have Sunmi here to be talking about uh, brain tumor imaging. Thank you, Sunmi. Thank you, Nancy. Um, thank you for this opportunity to share some imaging experience at UCSF. I have nothing to disclose. And what I'm going to talk about in next uh, 15 minutes or so is how do we image patients with brain tumor at UCSF? This does not mean it applies to everybody on this call, but I just wanted to share with you how we do things at UCSF. So the three things that I'm gonna cover is what type of brain tumors do we see at UCSF? What, are, what is our standard imaging protocol at UCSF? And are there any some special imaging tools that we use? So for me, I've been working at UCSF almost two decades, and it's literally every day is MGM. I see maybe five of these a day, meningioma, glioma, and metastasis. And I'm going to focus most of my talk on gliomas, but I will show you some examples of other types of tumors that we see as well. So of the gliomas, by far, the winner is unfortunately the most malignant of them all, which is glioblastoma. More than half of what we see at UCSF in terms of primary glioma patients is glioblastoma patients. Here's our standard brain tumor MRI protocol at UCSF. We always do pre-contrast T1 followed by post-contrast T1, T2, flare, DWI and ADC map, and susceptibility weighted imaging. These are what I consider the bread and butter. If you're doing brain tumor protocol without these five, six, six sequences, then you will be missing an important diagnosis. But we also do some fancy physiologic MRIs as well. This is a diffusion, this is a perfusion, and this is a dynamic perfusion imaging that generates a dynamic susceptibility curve like this. We also do spectroscopy, fractional anisotropy map, functional MRI, and also diffusion tensor imaging to lay down the tra tracks for our surgeons who are operating very close to an eloquent structure, such as a descending corticospinal tract. But for this talk, I'm only really going to focus on four imaging methods that we do for almost all brain tumor patients at UCSF. Susceptibility weighted imaging, diffusion weighted imaging, perfusion MRI. There are two different types, arterial spin labeling and dynamic susceptibility contrast weighted perfusion. And I'm going to finish off with MR spectroscopy, the proton MRS that includes two hydroxyglutarate MR spectroscopy. So let's start with susceptibility weighted imaging. We now have unprecedented details of the venous anatomy that we can see with this particular imaging technique. Only takes about a five minutes of imaging time. But for brain tumor patients, we really uh, acquire this sequence to really look for, are we looking at calcium or are we looking at iron? There are three patterns that we run into when we're uh, looking at our brain tumor patients. The vast majority of our patients, particularly who've had radiation therapy, will develop these multitude of small microhemorrhages, the telltale sign that our outstanding radiation oncologists have radiated that brain. We also these see this type of very interesting stacked appearance of a vasculopathy, whether it be treatment related or in this case, this is a patient with venulitis, inflammation of the venous structures, but susceptibility weight, weighted imaging can capture that as well. And we can also see a mass that's predominantly 
hemorrhagic component. So here's a case that came through not too long, a couple of weeks ago at UCSF. Patient is having headaches. CT shows this mass. Here's a pre-contrast T1. Here's post-contrast T1. Now, based on these, uh, both MR and CT, diagnosis can be challenging, but once you add susceptibility-weighted imaging, there's no question that 99% of this mass is composed of blood products. And this is a path-proven cavernous malformation, and we found another cavernous malformation. Very helpful sequence. Here's an example. Susceptibility-weighted imaging suggests either meningioma or subdural hematoma, but we can do what's called a fancy face filter sus susceptibility-weighted imaging that tells us the calcium appears bright on face filter SWI. So we know that this is a benign dural calcification and not a meningioma and not a um, blood containing structure. And here is a CT to prove that. So we really don't need CT to prove something is calcium anymore because now we have this susceptibility weighted imaging. Here's a patient who was radiated multiple times for ependymoma. Looks like a very angry looking mass in the brainstem, but patient had a posterior fossa fourth ventricle ependymoma. Once you add the susceptibility weighted imaging, these are numerous micro hemorrhages associated with radiation therapy, and this is radiation necrosis. Moving on to DWI, this is a critical sequence for us. It tells us something that no other sequence can show us. And there are really three patterns of DWI that we look for in patients presenting with brain uh, mass. And here are the three patterns, homogeneously reduced diffusion and diffusion that disappears in the background and lesions that have leading edge reduced diffusion. So let me show you an example. Here's a gentleman who was given to us, came to our imaging center saying that patient has a right frontal glioblastoma. But once you add diffusion and ADC map, the whole rim enhancing lesion is homogeneously reduced diffusion. This is hallmark pathognomonic of this intracranial abscess. So this is what you're seeing there. Another example of a patient who came to our institution from outside with a diagnosis of left parietal glioblastoma. Once you see DWI and ADC, this is not glioblastoma. This is what I call PIT plus in there. How about this pattern? You will see that very different from that abscess, there's a leading edge reduced diffusion. There are second lesion here too. This was thought to be a lymphoma and this is not compatible with lymphoma in terms of diffusion. And just to show you the difference between how hard this can be, one of these patients had brain tumor, very difficult to tell. But once you add DWI, you know that this leading edge reduced diffusion in a rim enhancing mass, this is very, very suggestive of tumor factor demyelinating lesion. And this was indeed biopsied by one of our surgeons and proven for that. So difference between glioma and this happens to be a very low-grade glioma, and this is a tumor factor demyelinating lesion. You could see a very different pattern of diffusion that helps us really drill down, are we looking at brain tumor or are we looking at brain tumor mimic? Two different patients, very similar looking post-con and flare. Once you add DWI, there's no mystery. This patient at the top has glioblastoma. This patient at the bottom has intracranial abscess or pus in there. How about this patient? Post-contrast, flare, diffusion is homogeneously reduced. This is a primary Sienna's lymphoma. How about this patient? This patient had, it's an adult patient who also had a history of colon cancer and presented with this hemispheric left cerebellar mass. So big differential here, obviously, with somebody who had uh, systemic cancer as metastasis. But once you add diffusion-weighted imaging, this homogeneously reduced bulky solid tumor is not the most typical appearance of a metastasis. 
this really raises the possibility of a highly cellular, high, uh, small round blue cell type of tumor. Indeed, this was a medulloblastoma and not a metastatic cancer. How about this young lady? She was thought to have a stroke because DWI and ADC maps showed very homogeneously reduced diffusion. But in fact, this is a diffuse glioma IDH wild type. And whenever we see a non-enhancing mass that looks like glioma, we go and look for DWI and ADC map. And if indeed this non-enhancing mass is reduced, this is a telltale sign of most likely a highly aggressive malignant glioma. Move on to perfusion. We do two different types of perfusion, the dynamic contrast enhanced and we also do non-contrast enhanced arterial spin labeling. Here's a patient who had an inflammatory CSF thought to have a some type of inflammatory changes or vasculitis or some type of um, um, inflammatory process in the brain. But once you add ASL perfusion, this is a hypervascular solid mass. This is glioblastoma. How about this patient has a very solid enhancing pre-contrast, post-contrast. DWI is not reduced. So this is not a cellular mass. So there's some differential for this cerebellar mass. It's clearly not medulloblastoma because it's not reduced on diffusion. But once you add perfusion, we know that this is a highly vascular mass and this is a hemangioblastoma. How about this patient? Patient had anaplastic oligo, received a bastin. Now that's the DWI appearance. Is this a tumor or what is this? Here's the ADC map to prove that this is true, true, reduced diffusion. We see this quite often post avastin therapy. But once we add perfusion, we know that this, there is no vascularity there. This is a dead brain tumor. And this is a tumor necrosis that we're seeing as a completely void of blood flow or blood volume in that region. This is a patient who had a glioma that appears to have more symptoms. Now you look at flare and post-con, doesn't look like there's too much going on other than this mass-like flare. However, we know that patient had this diagnosis called diffuse glioma IDH wild type. And as you know, this is not a very good diagnosis because there's um, high malignant potential. But once you add perfusion, there's no question that the anterior lump of that flare lesion is actually a live tumor. And this is indeed a path proven recurrent diffuse glioma IDH wild type. We also use perfusion to figure out is this something good tumor or, ben or neutral tumor or malignant tumor. The both patient has a right frontal tumor. Here's T2, they look very similar. But once you add perfusion, you know that the pot patient at the bottom has a true, true increase in blood um, volume within that tumor. And these are both path proven grade two versus grade three astrocytoma. And I'm gonna finish off with proton MR spectroscopy. This is a super powerful technique. What you're looking at here is a normal spectroscopic appearance of a normal brain at two points uh, parts per million, we see robust and acetyl aspartate, the neuronal marker. And about half as high is the choline normal. And we use creatine as our internal reference. And this is a quiet, this, it takes about two minutes of, your, of our scanning time to get an image like this. And there are four patterns that we look for in brain tumor patients, the proliferative, hypoxic, infectious, and necrotic. So what do I mean by that? So proliferative, we look for high, high levels of choline. In hypoxic, we look for this very distinct doublet of lactate at 1.3 ppm. For infectious, we look for all these very interesting molecules, amino acids, acetate, alanine, and look at how very low choline is. So this is a process, not a proliferative, but a process that's harboring uh, infectious material.
And then in the last category is a big peak around 0 0.9 to 1.3. So this is a peak that both uh, em encompass lactate as well as lipid. And you'll see that there is hardly any choline left here. NAA is pretty low as well. So this is what we see, for example, with radiation necrosis. So some real life examples. This patient was told that he had a brain metastasis, not just one, but two. But the patient said, but I don't have a systemic cancer. So the patient came to UCSF and we'd imaged and we put a spectroscopy. And to our surprise, the choline was not really elevated. The NAA was down, but there was undeniable lactate peak. And again, NAA is down, the lactate peak, although not specific for this entity, but putting this together, the fact that choline is not elevated, that this is not going to be a true proliferative cancer process. And this is a path proven demyelinating lesions. And instead of patient going home with a diagnosis of devastating bilateral metastasis in the brain, patient was treated with steroids and patient is doing well. How about this patient came to our institution with a diagnosis of glioblastoma? Yes, kind of looks like glioblastoma. We had DWI, as I told you already, areas of reduced diffusion, very suggestive of abscess. But this was a case about 10 years ago. And our surgeon said, are you really, really sure? Can you be 100% sure? So we brought the patient down and we did two different single voxel. Like I said, this is, takes about two minutes of scanning time. And what we've shown here is that we've shown that choline the proliferative marker is not elevated. Instead, we got acetate, we got lactate, we got amino acids, and we got alanine. And here are the specific peaks where those metabolites occur. And this is very, very characteristic of an intracranial abscess, which this was. This is a patient with um, radiation necrosis. So we brought the patient back down and we did spectroscopy on this patient, and there's some lactate. You must be aware that radiation necrosis is a dynamic process. If we catch the patients during fairly early acute or subacute stage, we may see some high choline as well. But the real key is to pay attention to the lactate and look at the NAAP. There's some NAA, which is a neuronal marker that is still there. So it shows you that this is going to be more of a radiation necrosis. More example of demyelinating lesion showing very high lactate. And this is a patient who thought to be have a brain tumor, but proven with the spectroscopy and MR perfusion was elevated, but this is a TDL. Here's a patient with radiation necrosis, predominantly showing you lipid. One last example is 2-HG, and this is a uncle metabolite for diffuse IDH mutant tumor such as this. And we can actually do this. Here's a patient who we followed for almost two decades with growing lesion. Our outstanding researchers did 2-HG spectroscopy and found it. And our surgeons, Dr. Berger took the patient, I believe, to the uh, OR. And this is an oligodendroglioma IDH mutant. But you already know that from the spectroscopy. This is the proton spectroscopy showing you super high choline. So we already knew this was going to be a highly proliferative process. And that's an oligodendroglioma with IDH mutant showing you 2-HG oncometabolite. So in summary, you must have this bread and butter sequence, but you have to add these physiologic MR imaging to arrive at the right diagnosis. And it's been really honored to work with our neuro-oncologists and neurosurgeons. So I thank you for your attention and email me with any questions you might have. Thank you.